I'm Professor Michael Saylor at the University of California, San Diego. I'm in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, but I'm also a member affiliate in the nanoengineering and the bioengineering programs here. Uh, our research focus is on uh, silicon-based nanomaterials and primarily nanomedicine. Uh, nanomedicine is an interesting area. It's the area where you uh, try to use uh, nanotechnology to improve either existing medications or develop new types of medical devices, procedures, or materials that could be used uh, you know, more effectively than current technologies. Uh, one of the areas we work in, sometimes we refer to it as nanorobots. Uh, we work with silicon and make these things into very small nanoparticles and they swim through the body and attach themselves to diseased tissues and usually the interior of the material has some type of a uh, nanostructure that can actually hold a payload. Uh, the payload might be something like uh, a small molecule drug that's an anti-cancer drug or it might be a, a fluorescent molecule or a magnetic uh, nanoparticle that would allow us to improve our ability to image uh, those tissues. Uh, so the focus is on kind of two general areas in nanomedicine. Uh, sometimes the whole area is referred to as nanotheranostics, uh, which is a combination of the term therapy and diagnostics. So if you have a nanoparticle, let's say it glows, it's fluorescent, um, you put it into the body, it swims around, it finds a tissue. If you image that tissue under uh, a black light or a near-infrared light, uh, you might see some uh, contrast, you might see it glowing there, and that would tell you, say, where the disease is. If you're looking for a tumor in the body, uh, it would tell you where that tumor is. Uh, and then the diagnostic aspect of it is the fluorescence I described. The theranostic or the therapeutic aspect of it is that that nanoparticle may carry some kind of a therapeutic molecule, a drug that's an anti-cancer drug, so it could go into the body, find the tumor, tell you there's a tumor there, tell you there's multiple tumors there, and then deliver that, that, that drug. A lot of interesting areas that we work in uh, in terms of diseases. Uh, cancer is a big one for nanotechnology, and, and uh, mainly uh, that's because in cancer nanotechnology, uh, generally you're treating a patient who may be very, very sick. And so if there's some side effects or problems with the nanostructure because this technology is so new, um, it's, it's not as dangerous. For example, if you gave a nanoparticle to somebody and it maybe it, it would have problems five years from now, if you're trying to treat a cancer that the patient's going to die in six months, then you can buy them five years. That's actually a good thing. Um, but now more and more you're seeing nanotechnology moving into disease areas where you don't have such a profound um, catastrophic outcome for the patient. Um, you know, nanoparticles are used in sunscreen, for example. People put titanium dioxide uh, and other uh, materials into sunscreens to help protect uh, the, you know, the, the skin from uh, ultraviolet radiation. Well, you're doing that on healthy pe people, right? So uh, if you're trying to treat a disease that's not totally deadly, then you have to think of tools and techniques to make your nanostructures not be dangerous. You don't want to make the next asbestos. You don't want to have a nanomaterial that's going to get into the patient's system and stay there forever. Um, you know, likely if it's there long enough, it's probably going to do some harm. And so really the nanostructures that we make are, are dissipative by nature. We design our structures so they fall apart. Uh, and that's really, really important because if they don't fall apart, you know, eventually they may do some harm in the body, but furthermore, they're, they're going to be excreted and they'll get into the environment. And if you have a nanostructure that doesn't fall apart in the human, it won't fall apart in the environment possibly and it could then get into the water system and the air system, the air we breathe, water we drink, and you know, not necessarily something we want to have happen. Our, our group has uh, been directed in probably two general areas uh, over many years now. One is this nanomedicine area, and the other is this area of chemical sensing. Uh, we make a lot of photonic materials. We, we play a lot of games with silicon to make it do weird things in the visible spectrum. So this is a, a silicon-based photonic crystal, and uh, this, this device or this material is uh, etched out of single crystal silicon um, and it's etched with a certain layered structure that gives it this photonic property. So we call them sometimes structural colors or artificial colors. Uh, and um, it turns out you can play games with those colors. You can, uh, when chemicals absorb to the silicon surface, the color will change. So you can use that 
color change as a means of doing chemical sensing. Um, and then in the nanomedicine, we can't make a structure that big. We have to make it much smaller. But we still start with silicon. So this is our, uh, our raw material. This is a silicon wafer. Uh, crystalline silicon, uh, very high purity. So for nanomedicine, it's actually a good thing that the semiconductor industry has spent so much time trying to get these things so pure because now we know at least we're starting with a very clean material. Uh, we take this and we electrochemically process it, uh, machine it uh, so that it makes very, very small holes. Uh, a nanoparticle that we'll make in this structures will be maybe 100 nanometers in size. Um, 100 nanometers is, you know, a human hair is um, 10,000 nanometers, and so you're looking at 1,000 times smaller, maybe 100 times, 1,000 times smaller than a human hair for a nanostructure. Um, and then the holes in that nanostructure are smaller still. They're maybe, you know, two, 2 to 10 nanometers in size. The advantage of having a hole that small is that you can fill it with something. Uh, and the, the dimensions of the hole are really approximately uh, the size of a lot of protein-based molecules, antibodies that we might use as therapeutics, and also oligonucleotides. We do a lot of work in gene therapy and a, 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 an siRNA, an RNA strand that you might use for a therapeutic uh, is roughly on the size scale of a couple nanometers. So when these things go into these structures, they basically fill the holes almost completely. And then uh, we trap them in there and then have them come out various different chemistries that we use to do that. The ones who do this well, I think, are the ones who actually go in vivo very quickly, which means they, they, they prove out their nano, basic nano properties, basic capabilities, uh, what we call in vitro, in a beaker, in, in a petri dish, with live cells, or just in water, something like that. Um, but then ultimately, they've got to get that into a, an animal to see how that system behaves. And it's really, really important. Because um, you can spend years going along a path where you think it's going to work out, um, and then you get into that, that animal experiment and it's totally different. You know, the living systems are so complex and there's so many things going on and there are so many processes for eliminating foreign objects and uh, for keeping the organism alive and so much mass transport going on in these very, very complex systems that how a nano uh, structure engages and interacts with that living system is often really, really surprising. I use the term robots in, in the scientific community. We don't really talk about them being nanorobots. Uh, it's a good concept, but in fact, what it's really doing is very similar to what even conventional medicines do. You take an aspirin tablet. Okay, you're directing where it goes because you're eating it, so you know it's going to get into your stomach. Uh, the structure's been engineered so it dissolves at a certain rate, so you get the pain relief in the right time scale, and it doesn't give you an upset stomach then dissolve too quickly. So there, there's lots of things in, you know, in, in those nano structures that we work with that are similar to aspirin tablets. You can use a construct of nano robotics, but in the end you're just playing games with chemistry. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's not, uh, the, the thing that's really important about it also is that because these are dissipative systems, um, they're not gonna like swim around in your body and take you over. <laughs> because uh, they're going to go away. They, they, they have that um, built into their structure, just like an aspirin tablet. Um, you know, you, you eat it, it's going to dissolve. And, and I think that's probably the most important aspect of nanotechnology as it pertains to medicine, is the structures we make really can't be the kinds of structures that the typical materials engineer would think about, where you want to build a very robust system that's going to perform forever. Uh, we have to have planned obsolescence in our systems.